Hello, and welcome to the Alexander Society. This is a podcast where we discuss the great personalities and moments in history while also carrying on the time-honored tradition of temporarily screwing up our brains with alcohol. I'm your host, El Hombre de Muchos Libros, Derek, joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, El Jefe de Bebida, Tim. How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing good. I actually kind of knew that because I'm guessing I'm the Jefe, I'm guessing is chief, if I remember correctly, of beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, chief or boss. Chief or boss of booze, basically. How are you doing tonight, Derek? Oh, I'm I'm doing fantastic. I got two. I got two drinks. I am so, so excited to be able to drink tonight. <laughs> um... So what are you drinking tonight, Derek? Yeah, what I'm drinking uh, for my shots, I I cannot believe that my regular liquor store actually had this stuff. Only place I've ever seen it. Uh, La Gretona tequila. The only tequila that I've ever like genuinely actually enjoyed and consciously gone out to like looking for. See, me and you are completely different. Tequila is my liquor. Yeah, I'm a rum guy. That's my thing. I, I'm not normally a tequila guy, but this stuff. Oh, I'm going. OK, yeah, I'm going to save this for you. Uh, and then uh, the drink, uh, the beer that I'm drinking, I just got some Corona extra uh, because I was thinking basic bitch. I am a basic bitch. This is the best like like mainstream cheapo uh, like tailgate beer. This is a hands down corona is the absolute best uh and i will die on that hill and i also got some i also got some limes cut up and I'm, i do the thing where you put your you put your thumb on the on the top and you turn it upside down and let it float to the oh i can't do modellos without it uh, absolutely not no uh what are you what are you drinking tim so i got a marshall beer local beer slash craft beer like i've been trying to go with with the podcast and it's grand lake it's supposed to be a light ale and i we didn't have nearly enough shots last episode so i'm still working on that scarlet ibis yeah yeah i should have planned out planned out those rules a little bit better but any anyways let's run down the rules real quick our first rule is anytime i ask derek to clarify the timeline or remind him who a person is in the story we're going to take one sip which unfortunately just because of the nature of the setting we're talking about might end up happening a lot rule number two if i stumble over a word in spanish we take three sips which there's a fair bit of span i i didn't put a whole lot of spanish in here i made a few like translations but but there, there's still a fair few um then our final rule is if there's a change in the president we'll do what derek we are going to take a shot every time that there's an old president goes out and a new president goes in i imagine that happens more times than you would hope giving uh it's a rule yeah we're, we're we're going to be focusing on a 10 year stretch of history and we're going to be taking quite a few shots. All right, let's go ahead and get our shots in. Come by. Yeah, prost. So Derek, you've danced around it already. So what are we talking about tonight? Hey, I'll get into it. I'll set up, I'll set it up a little bit. There's not a lot of setup to this one. So in 1872, okay. So in 1872, there was a rebellion in Mexico. And this general named Porfirio Diaz comes to power on the promise of getting rid of dictators in the presidency and preserving Mexico's free elections and the federal system. So they have like this federal system that's kind of like the U.S.'s where they have different states. It's the same system they have today. They're literally the United States of Mexico. So it's very similar to the U.S. Diaz, though, turned out to be kind of a dictator himself. As most tend to do. Yeah. Uh, he got around term limits and rigged elections to keep himself in power. He got around the whole representative democracy thing by appointing. The, there's these guys uh, in Spanish. They're called uh, they're called like a, a jefe político or a political boss. And he used these guys uh, and their like private, their like personal police forces to kind of strong arm like local state administrations to do what his government wanted. So Diaz, he had these strong men. They were called, uh, the strong man would be called a jefe politico, uh, which is Spanish for like a political boss. And his regime was, came to be called the Porfiriado, just after his name, uh, Porfirio Diaz. So even though he was basically a dictator himself, he had this idea of liberalizing and modernizing Mexico 
to make it an industrial capitalist power in its own right. So he had this council that advised him and drafted policy. It was made up of, of these like liberal academics that were kind of technocrats that were called uh, the Scientificos, which is Spanish for the scientists. Don't you have, love how sometimes it's so easy to figure out what they're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, so Diaz and the Scientificos took foreign investment from Britain and the U.S., and they would use it to build up industry in the cities and lay down miles of railways and telegraph wires. And they started to build up like a real modern economy. Uh, it's just that that modern economy was all owned by foreign investors. And so none of the benefits of it were going back to the Mexican people. You see, see kind of what's going on here? Sounds like typical uh, laissez-faire trickle-down economics not working as usual. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just the classic imperialism, like colonialism, imperialism, just tale, tale as old as capitalism. I'll drink to that. Yeah, so in the countryside of Mexico... They were using, there's this old practice in the countryside of Mexico. It was a, a relic of the era of Spanish colonization. They were called haciendas. And haciendas were basically these big plantations that would be worked by locals who lived near it for wages. And they would be owned by absentee landlords who lived in the cities. Those landlords were called hacendados. And the the Porfiriado was taking these old relics of Spanish colonialism and they were starting to modernize them into like these factory farms that focused on on monocrops, especially like uh, sugarcane that they could export uh, internationally for shit tons of money. The problem was in order to expand those haciendas, they had to start seizing farmland that was worked by free the, this class of free peasant farmers that were called campesinos. And that policy was very obviously unpopular with campesinos who, you know, it's their land. No shit. And cu just culturally in the country of Mexico, these campesinos very much valued their own independence and their distinctness from the cities and from the government. There was also a racial component to it as well, because a lot of these campesinos were descendants of local native people. Uh, some of them were from, some of them, especially in central Mexico, were from the Mexica culture, or as white people call them, the Aztecs. I didn't know there was another name for the Aztecs. It makes sense there was. Uh... Yeah, yeah. The Aztecs called themselves the Mexica, which is where the name Mexico comes from. Me sitting here being blown away because that makes total sense, but I would have never known that. Yeah. yeah. And then also you still had Mayan people that lived further south. Was there their actual name? Um, I'm sure they had a name in their own language, um, but my, I don't I don't think Mayan is inaccurate, even as a translation. I'm not sure. I should have looked that up because <laughs> I'm a hack and a fraud. And so these... These campesinos had been farming in communal villages, which were called pueblos, farming like that for generations before Europeans even arrived, just hundreds of years, well, th th potentially thousands in some cases. And the haciendas encroaching on their land was very obviously a threat to their way of life and their culture and their heritage. One of these campesinos was a mestizo man, which means mestizo is... He was mixed Spanish and native ancestry, which is... That's what I was about to ask if I was remembering that correctly. It was uh, someone of mixed race at the time. Yeah, which is most Mexican people today are mestizo. Um, back then, it was there was a little bit more of a racial divide. Um, but anyways, so this man, his name was Emiliano Zapata. Emiliano Zapata was born on August 8th, 1879, in the Pueblo, the, the farming village of Enenequilco in the state of Morelos, which is the state that is just south of Mexico City. He was a really energetic kid. He loved animals. He loved the farming work that he was born into. He was a crack shot with a rifle. And he was the best horseback rider in his village by the time that he was 12. So... Just the the classic stereotype of like a, a like a good old country boy. That's who this guy was. Sounds like it. Sounds like a fine old boy. <laughs> I don't know where my brain was going with that. It just like eh. yeah, he's a good old boy. Uh, yeah. So 
as Zapata grew older, he became a bit of a ladies' man. He he had at least three kids. We're not sure exactly how many, but we're pretty sure three kids by the time he was 25, all with a woman that he wasn't married to, and they would end up breaking up later. And he also loved to drink and to fight. He was also, very, he cared a lot about his self-image. Uh, he wore very flashy, fancy clothing. Uh, he always wore the biggest sombreros that he could get his hands on. And he grew out this amazing, beautiful, just best mustache I have ever seen in my life. Beautiful mustache. And he grew... Jealous? Very jealous. Just gorgeous mustache. I could never pull off a mustache like that. But he's... It, so Zapata also had a very deep hatred for inequality and injustice. Growing up, he saw the local hacienda encroach on his neighbor's land. They would come in and they would fence off one of his neighbor's plots of land and essentially just seize it for themselves. And whenever the owner of that land would, would go to protest, that would, what was it was technically an illegal seizure, but it wasn't enforced by... like. It wasn't punished by the government. But whenever anybody would protest, the Asendado, the owner of the plantation, would hire gunmen who would go into the village and they'd just start indiscriminately killing livestock until the, un, until the farmer relented. So Zapata really hated haciendas and he spent all of his 20s trying to protect his village's land through any legal means that he could. He got a bit of a reputation because of this, and his village ended up electing him to be a town leader in 1909 when he was 30, which was very young to become a town elder for in, in his culture. As it turns out, that was a pretty wild time to become a prominent regional leader in the struggle against the Porfiriado's policies. Because in 1908, President Diaz had given an interview to an American journalist. And in this interview, he had basically said that the 1910 elections that were coming up would be completely free. His administration wouldn't interfere with the results at all. And he said that he wouldn't be running for re-election, which was huge because he had been president for 35 years. That's a long, long... He... Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem was he was lying. Oh, so... Good thing I didn't tell you, hey, does this mean we're taking a shot? Because that's a change of president? Um, yeah, hold off on it. It's coming very soon. <laughs> so even though he lied, it's coming up? Uh, so yeah, um, what he was probably trying to do was there were a lot of American investors. It was This was back when American and like investment capitalists still had a bit of like, uh, you know, values or an ideology. And... You mean that actually was a thing at one point? That actually was a thing at one point. There were a lot of, they were losing a lot of investments from the United States because a lot of them were concerned about the fact that Mexico very obviously didn't have many political freedoms and they care, actually cared about that. Oh, is this another one of those, we installed a leader things by the CIA or the US government? Uh, we're going to have a little bit of that coming up, but even that doesn't last very long. <laughs> This stuff changes very fastly, very, very fast in this period. Goodness. Yeah. So, yeah. So what he was trying to say in this interview was probably just to assuage the concern of some of the American investors. investors. But the interview made it back to a, a Mexican newspapers. And so the Mexican people found out about it. And so they started running candidates on platforms of political reform. And one of these reformers who ended up running for the office of president, and then when it became obvious that Diaz was lying, ended up running against him, was this guy named Francisco Madero. Like I said, Diaz lied, ran for re-election. But by this time, Mexicans were already getting really excited about Madero's run, and he was becoming a real political threat to Diaz's power. And so Diaz made a mistake that Mexico would be paying for for the next decade. What did he do? He had Madero arrested and then forced him into exile. 
what was so what was his quote unquote justification to get him out of the country so he couldn't run for president no 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 i mean he had to have a lie what was his lie like why was he kicked out uh i'm not sure um I, i'm not sure what diaz's justification for it was like most the sources that i read didn't even like bring it up because it was so unimportant and everybody knew it was bullshit Ah, uh, so it was one of those things that they, it was thinly veiled and they were just like, yeah, fuck it. Right, yeah. So Madero ended up fleeing across the Rio Grande River to San Antonio, Texas. And while in San Antonio, he declared a rebellion against Diaz's rule. He drafted this document, which called for the Mexican people to rise in revolt and to overthrow President Diaz. It outlined all of the crimes that Diaz had committed against the Mexican people. And it laid out a list of reforms that would be implemented once Diaz was out of office. And this document was came to be called the plan of San Luis Potosi. I, I was fully expecting to trip over that one. I was having so much trouble pronouncing that name, but San Luis Potosi is just the, uh, that actually sounds pretty simple to pronounce. Not like not literally, but out of the, words that could come from that language is what i mean yeah it's because i the reason i trip over it is because i tried to pronounce it like the french way so san louis but it's san luis potosi okay and san luis potosi is just a region of it's the area of mexico that uh madero is from so he just named it after that most importantly to our story it contained a proposal for a land reform, which would protect the property rights of peasant farmers. That was all Zapata needed to hear, and he was on board with this rebellion. And so, with the publishing of this document, the Mexican Revolution began. That is what this this period is called, the Mexican Revolution. And by February of 1911, rebel armies were raiding federal institutions all over Mexico. Mexico just exploded. In March of that year, 1911, a small force of about 70 men was organized in Morelos, and Zapata was elected to command this revolt by his fellow campesinos. So he took his little army and he started raiding in Morelos uh, and also in the neighboring state of Puebla. They were specifically targeting administrative offices, the property of Asendados. Uh, they were fighting off like smaller unit, like smaller garrisons of federal troops, uh, wherever they found them. And everywhere they went, they were joined by more and more of these campesinos who were joining up because they were going to steal stuff from the, the big landowners, the Asandados. So they were on board with that immediately. In just three months, Zapata's army grew from 70 men to over 4,000. Jesus Christ. Meteoric rise. He yeah. went from being a, a poor farmer in a small village nobody's ever heard of to the leader of the Mexican Revolution in the south of Mexico in three months. Talk about a change of lifestyle. Jesus Christ. Yeah. None of them were soldiers. So none of them knew how to fight. But through trial and error, they developed some really effective guerrilla techniques that had federal forces on the run in almost every engagement. Hell yeah. Yeah. By late May, Zapata's army took control of the capital of Morelos, the city of Cuernavaca, and controlled pretty much the whole state. So pretty, pretty rad start. Pretty great start to his, his revolutionary career so far. Uh, on May 10th, the forces of Madero... Um, his armies were led by the his two chief generals, one guy named Pascual Orozco, and another guy you have definitely heard of, named Pancho Villa. I was about to ask, was it Pancho Villa? It was Pancho Villa. <laughs> they captured the border city of Guidad Juarez. Diaz knew that since they now had a foothold on the border where they could buy weapons and supplies from the U.S., and now that Zapata's armies of army of campesinos were now within a couple days march of Mexico City, the Porfiriato was probably done. And so Diaz began to negotiate for peace and a transition of power. 
The Treaty of Guidad Juarez was signed on May 21st, 1911, handing the state over to Francisco Madero. And five days later, Porfirio Diaz, 81 years old, hopped on a ship and sailed to France. That is a president change, sir. That is a president change. Prost. Cheers. Yeah, so Porfirio Diaz had ruled Mexico for 35 years, and he would never set foot in the country again. He'd die, I think, five years later in 19, or four or five years later, like 1915, I think. What was the term limit? Do the term limit? Were there term limits at the time? Because you said he was reelected. I, I want to know how long, much longer after his term, if he had won. Yeah. So, so when yeah, so when Diaz first rose to the presidency, uh, the term limit in the Constitution of 1857 was two eight two four year terms. So eight years, and he had been president for 35 years. What? <laughs> Talk about ignoring the rules. Yeah. So. Mexico was put under a provisional government with an interim president named Francisco de la Barra. And there was an election. They organized that an election would be planned the following fall. And of course, Francisco Madero, the father of the Mexican Revolution, was was projected to win. But soon it became clear to Zapata that the new administration was not as eager as he was to get the Pueblos back their land from the Asandados. Madero, let's, let's talk about Francisco Madero for a second. He was a man from the cities. He was raised in a well-off Asandado family. He had a liberal Western education. And so he had all of the natural distrust of poor people that comes naturally to people with his background. And on top of that, he kept hearing reports about the supposed brutality and banditry of Zapata's troops, which were reinforced, reinforcing his opinions of the campesinos as like, like barbaric, simple country folk who didn't know, who only knew labor and violence. That, that was kind of the, that was kind of the stereotype that people had. That people still have for country folk today, basically. But uh, but it, it was all being pushed along by the fact that all of the newspapers in Mexico City, which were all owned by Asandados, were were weaving these tales about the the massacres and the rapes and pillages pillaging that was being done by Zapata's army all through the countryside. This is where he got one of his most famous nicknames is from the during this period from these newspapers in Mexico City. He was being called Attila del Sur or Attila of the South. Interesting. Yeah, as in like Attila the Hun. This so I didn't know how to fit this in. There was no way for I tried several different drafts of this. I had no way to fit this into the story in any way that would flow naturally. So I'll just go ahead and mention it. Around this time, like right after Diaz was kicked out of office, uh, Zapata got married. Okay. He got married to a woman named Josefa Espejo, and she doesn't come up much at all in the story. I'm not really going to mention her again, because even Zapata himself kind of put her on the back burners for for his whole career. Um, but yeah, so he, he gets married in 1911. They would ultimately end up having two kids together, but both of them would die in infancy. But Zapata would end up having four more kids after that. Oh, so he's a cheating bastard. He had at least six girlfriends. Holy shit. Um, and he had kids with four of them. So, yeah, take take of that what you will. Um, so, back to Madero. So, despite the disagreements between Zapata and Madero, Zapata genuinely held out hope that the new president could be swayed to begin the land reform once he was officially elected president. But the influence of the Asandados and the new government, which, by the way, many of those Asandados were former supporters of Porfirio Diaz, the, their, their influence was just too great in the new government, and they were too important to this government's power. And so instead of playing along with Zapata, in August, the new government sent federal troops into Morelos in order to forcibly disband Zapata's army. And that is how the Mexican Revolution became a civil war. Damn. 
As fighting started up, Zapata had this realization that he was basically more or less the leader of the Mexican Revolution now. Uh, he he was the only guy left who was still fighting against the government. All of the other revolutionaries still supported Madero, including Pancho Villa. Uh, that, yeah, like Pancho Villa would idolize Madero to the de- till the day he died. Um, but anyways, Zapata realized that he wouldn't be able to rally the Mexican people if he didn't have an idea for them to grab onto, some sort of ideology or some vision of what the future could look like. And so he and some of his closest friends and lieutenants decided to draft their own plan, which was based, which was based on the plan of San Luis, San Luis Potosi. This new plan accused Madero of betraying the Mexican people and outlined an agrarian reform which would seize land from Asandados and redistribute it to the people of Mexico after all of the former loyalists of the Porfiriato had been purged from the government. Uh, the plan also stipulated that the federal government would be opened up to free elections, the local autonomy and the democracy of the pueblos would be guaranteed, and the Mexican people would remain armed and retain their right to defend themselves from anyone who would try to monopolize any resources or political power in the nation. This document was called the Plan of Ayala, which was named after the place where it was published, uh, a town called Villa de Ayala. The movement and the ideology around the Plan of Ayala came to be named after Emiliano Zapata. It was called Zapatismo, or Zap- Zapatism in, uh, in English. And Zapata's followers came to be called the Zapatistas. And so that's what I'm going to be referring to them as from this point forward. Okay. So all over Southern Mexico, when the federal army came in, all, all of Southern Mexico grabbed their guns again and rose back up in revolt. And they were coming out of their pueblos and they were going up to the mountains and they were joining Zapata's guerrilla war. The campesinos were campesinos all over the region started expropriating land from haciendas. Uh, they were driving out federal administrators at the point of guns. They were launching hit and run attacks on federal garrisons. It was it was just the start of the revolution all over again. In response to that, the bull, the federal government put most of southern Mexico under martial law, and they sent in a brutal, violent general. This this guy's an absolute monster. This guy named Juvencio Robles, and he was sent in at the head of an army to put down the Zapatistas. His troops would massacre and burn down several pueblos suspected of aiding the Zapatistas, which had the negative effect of driving even more people into the Zapatistas' ranks. And in response to every burning and every massacre, the Zapatistas would attack, would start to raid their supply lines, start to pick off individual units. And then they'd respond with even more reprisal massacres and things like that. It was just a vicious cycle of violence. And it went on for over a year with neither side budging at all. It would take an outside force to get to break the stalemate, which is exactly what happened in February of 1913. They were out trying to oust the, current president right yeah so now so now madero was in power and uh and he wasn't fulfilling the uh land reform demands of the zapatistas and so the zapatistas rose back up and revolt against the new revolutionary government okay is that a clarification yes technically it's a clarification we'll we'll give you that so in february of 1913 conservative elements in the federal army launched a coup against Madero, and fighting broke out in Mexico City. After 10 days of fighting, in which I... This is insane. I can't remember the exact name that Mexican people... It's like the like the week of death or something like that. Um, but it was 10 days of fighting in Mexico City. Thousands of civilians were killed by artillery fire. Thousands in 10 days? Thousands. It was a bloodbath. I think some I saw some insane stat like for every for every one soldier that was killed during this coup attempt, there were like 300 civilians killed. Holy fuck. 
It was horrific. Yeah. So after 10 days of fighting, the American ambassador to Mexico, who nobody knew at the time, had actually helped organize the coup. So there's some of that, some of that U.S. interfering and overthrowing regimes type thing, regime change type thing. When does that not happen, though? The U.S. has their grubby fingers in all, just about every revolution they can. Yeah, pretty much. But but yeah, so the American ambassador who had helped organize the coup in the first place negotiated a ceasefire, which gave control of the government to conservative army general Victoriano Huerta. And Madero was assassinated the day after. Let me get my shot ready. Yeah, so we are three years into this revolution, and we've had... And we're about to hit the third president. Yeah, we just got to the third president. That's crazy. That all happened in three years, though, too. Yeah, that's so... The Mexican Revolution was so fucking jam-packed with stuff. Well, what's insane about that is we haven't even been talking, what, like maybe 30, 40 minutes, and we've covered that long of a time period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just to let you know, there's seven more years. Yeah, you told me it was a 10-year period. Jesus Christ. Are are there any slow periods in that time frame? Um, yeah, when it gets closer to the end, um, the regime change comes out. Or the or the yeah the the presidential overthrowing kind of slows down a bit uh, as we as we get closer like the last three or four years. But you ready to take that shot? Uh, yeah, Kampai. Yeah, prost. Oh, where did we leave off? Um, okay, yeah. So, uh, we were just installing the third. Uh, Diaz had just been, I believe, murdered, right, or like assassinated. Blah. I can't. Remember. Madero. Madero. My side. Uh, yeah, Madero. Madero had just been, yeah. Madero's been murdered. Huerta, uh, this conservative army general Victoriano Huerta is now the new president, basically a military dictator. You actually didn't tell us who got installed, uh, because I kind of kind of interrupted you on that. Apologies. All right. So yeah. So Madero's out. Huerta's in. Uh, Madero. Yeah. Madero was assassinated. Huerta. That's what I meant to say. Huerta sent envoys to offer peace deals to Zapata, mostly offering him like wealth and political power in order to uh, to get him to portray his movement and incorporate him into the new power structure. But Zapata responded by arresting the peace envoys that Huerta sent. They ended up being summarily executed later. Um, Which one? The ones that Zapata arrested? Yeah. That's three sips. Oh, that's fun. So in response to Huerta's offer, peace offer, uh, Zapata had these peace envoys arrested and summarily executed and then started started assaulting the trains that were heading in and out of Mexico City uh, just to scare the shit out of people, mostly. Uh, the, I, I mean, if you're in his position, why not, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to put print because, um, because this whole... His whole movement is predicated on like like rural folk rising up, and what better like what better way to strike at uh, the system that you're trying to change and to reform and to overthrow than by attacking the source what you think is the source of all your problems, which is the cities. So so yeah, the only way that Zapata would ever accept peace was after the plan of Ayala had been adopted as the official policy of the government. What is the plan of Ayala? I don't think he got into that before. Yeah, I did. It's the the plan that he he drafted uh, when he rose up against uh, Madero's government. It's the one that called for land reform. Okay, I guess my 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 brain only got the land reform part of it, not called the the plan. It was. Yeah, yeah. It's the it's the plan of Ayala. That's a clarification. You and your technical ass shit. Well, I need I. I just, I just wanted to drink, man. So, yeah, so Huerta, of course, retaliated, and he reta retaliated by once again sending Robles, that that absolute fucking monster I mentioned earlier, sent him back into Morelos with another army to put down the Zapatistas again. And by the end of the month, the federal government was once again in control of all of the major settlements in Morelos. Robles. Again, it's it it just all it's it's just a cycle. It keeps repeating. Robles would start carrying out massacres that would drive more people into the Zapatista army, 
the Zapatistas were able to do more damage to the federal army. Zapata's... So I got to ask, why do you think that cycle repeated itself? Do you think the leaders were just not good for their position and thus the people got dissatisfied? Or do you think the rebellion just wouldn't be satisfied at all to begin with, at least for that time? It's a mix of just like the nature of how revolutions like this work. Like they're, they overthrew the old regime and they've got a whole bunch of different people with a whole bunch of different ideas and ambitions, all trying to vie for the exact same seat of power. And so it's just going to cause new, it's just going to cause a cycle of different people becoming uh, different people rising to power um, oh, excuse me, rising to power just in different ways with different ideas and then immediately getting kicked out by somebody else. And then the other side of that is just the fact that uh, Zapata and his movement were completely uncompromising. They, they would not compromise to save their own lives, literally. As you'll see, uh, as, we, as we get into this more, you'll understand they would rather die than compromise on these ideas that they're fighting for. Damn. And so, and so with every new government that rises up, they, they need a way to get to deal with the problem of Southern Mexico and its revolt. And the only way that that's going to be resolved is if their plans are put into place, which none of these governments are ever willing to do. And so that's why this cycle just keeps repeating over and over again. Just the natural cycle of power, of the changing of power in a revolution and and the, just the complete uncompromising nature of Zapata's movement. I mean, at least they had, at least they weren't like that. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I guess that's a good thing because like in a certain respect, obviously, if you're not willing to compromise you're never going to get anything done in the long long run but yeah and that that becomes a real problem for them later on but that's something we could at least spiritually take away from this is we should always hold our political leaders to a higher standard because right now um no matter what side you're looking on i you can honestly say um if you fall in at least with our current political sphere um, if you live live on one side or the other, no one is doing really good by their constituents, in my opinion. Right. Let's not get too deep into that because that's a whole can of worms. We were, yeah. So Robles, that that general, that piece of shit general Robles was uh, sent back in at the head of the army, but this time by Huerta's government. So Zapata's army uh, was also being bolstered, not just by this influx of campesinos from all over southern Mexico who were coming back in, um, but also by this influx of refugees from Mexico City, especially intellectuals who were suddenly coming under repression by the Huerta government. Because uh, they're, they're hoping oh, Huerta, being a very conservative guy, was trying to crack down on like like liberal and radical organizers within Mexico city. Um, and amongst these, uh, these refugee intellectuals was, um, and I, 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 sh I should have seen this coming with the topic, but I honestly didn't intend this. Uh, one of the groups or one of a group of intellectuals from Mexico city that came in was a group of anarcho syndicalists. Uh, you know, like like Lucy Parsons. Oh, wow! I didn't realize there were any anarchists in this movement. There was a huge anarchist movement in Mexico in the early 20th century. Again, this is probably just me not thinking ahead and making connections, but it makes sense that during this time that you're talking about, there were a lot of uh anarchist ideals because it just makes sense, you know. Um. It, something interesting, um, a little bit of overlap. Uh, there, uh, Lucy Parsons actually helped organize a bunch of like fundraisers that were supporting foreign volunteers that were going 
like American volunteers that were going down to Mexico to fight in the armies of Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. I know it's no longer really a rule, but I'm going to sip because that's a previous subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's sip. Also, Lucy was a badass in her early days. She kind of wimped out at the end, but still. Uh, Lucy was a com- complicated person. But yeah, so there's uh, one of one of this group of intellectuals uh, who were refugees from Mexico City were in a narco syndicalist group called the Casa del Obrero Mundial, or in English, the House of the Workers of the World. And they were the Zap. I'm telling you, that's not as uh, bad A as it sounds in Spanish. The Workers of the World does not sound as good as that. Yeah. Casa del Obrero Mundial. Uh, And these guys would be the Zapatistas' very first exposure to the ideas of socialism and communism. And they would end up having... How much effect does that have on Zapatista and all that? That's that that is a major point of contention, actually. Um, How so? uh, From what from the research that I've done, I would say that it had a very they definitely had an influence in the way that the Zapatistas like communicated and the way that the way that they expressed their ideas. But it didn't. from what I've been able to tell, it it didn't have an appreciable effect on like the actual way that they that they formed their own ideology. Damn, I was I was hoping it kind of influenced their ideology. It it definitely had an influence on the movement. Don't get me wrong, but it's but Zapatismo itself had more significantly more roots in just the experience of the campesinos in Mexico. It was a purely Mexican ideology. And and a, a big reason why it didn't have more influence was because a lot of the campesinos really didn't trust these anarchists because they came from the cities. They were like, well, they're, they're pretty well-educated people from the cities. Um, and campesinos kind of saw educated people from the cities as the enemy like they were the embodiment of the people that they were the the system that they were trying to fight against because well these they were like well these guys are intellectuals from the city the the people like madero and some later guys that we're going to talk about too um were also intellectuals from the city so and they're fighting against our cause, so these anarchists must be all must also like not like our cause, and so there's just this distrust, this natural distrust that they had for just city folk, basically. It's just the the rural urban divide just kind of being forced to confront itself in, um, regardless of like what the actual beliefs of the people of of these anarchists were. Because these anarchists were, as soon as they got into the Zapatista cause, they were 100% on board. They, even even to this day, anarchists still revere Emiliano Zapata as like a pre, like an, an example of, of like anarchists, like anti, an, anti-capitalist, decentralized democratic ideals in practice. Um, but at the time, Zapatista's, really didn't trust anarchists. I thought I'd bring that up because they are going to have a bit of a bit of time. We're, we're going to talk about them a little bit more later. After after Madero was overthrown and Huerta came to power, there was another rebellion that was spreading through the north by former supporters of Madero. The three main leaders of this revolt were um, these two guys... Uh, Venustiano Carranza, another guy named Alvero Obregón, and of course our old friend Pancho Villa. And they all revolted in northern Mexico after Huerta took power, and they formed a block that called themselves the Constitutionalists. I can't remember exactly what that is in Spanish, but yeah, I'll just call them the Constitutionalists. And their their political leader, their ideological leader, was Carranza. And Carranza outlined his 
it, we have a third plan. We have another plan, another document called a plan of whatever. How how many of these plans slash documents are there that throughout this? Four. Okay, not as bad as I was expecting to be perfectly honest. Yeah, the last one comes at the end, like basically at after the revolution is over. But Carranza had his plan, the plan of Guadalupe. And the con- the basically the constitutionalists wanted to reform the political system in order to get rid of what was left of the Porfiriato's authoritarianism, which was embodied in this new military dictator Huerta. But they said next to nothing about the social reforms that the Zapatistas wanted. Uh, but Zapata sought to coordinate with the constitutionalists, even though he ideologically disagreed with them. But, you know, revolutions make strange bedfellows. Um so he sought to Zapata sought to coordinate with these constitutionalists, hoping to launch join us like joint assaults, uh, and also to get some guns from them since they could buy as many guns as they needed over the border in the U.S. But he still didn't trust them, and he feared that he might have to fight them if they refused to uphold the reforms of the Plan of Ayala once Puerto was overthrown. They were never able to properly act, like actually militarily coordinate. And that that was mostly because they were divided in the middle of the country, which was controlled by the Huerta government. But they did have a de facto alliance through 1913 and early 1914. After over a year of guerrilla fighting in April 1914, the Zapatistas were organized and powerful enough to finally go on the offensive. So what they did was they attacked and seized the state of Guerrero, which is south of Morelos, including the port city of Acapulco. With the federal army weakened by that defeat, they launched another attack and recaptured the eastern half of the state of Morelos, the, the, home, the home state of the Southern Revolution. At that same time, and this, this is completely fucking out of left field. So at the same time that that's happening, American president Woodrow Wilson ordered an assault on the, on the Huerta controlled port city of Veracruz, even though the previous president, which was William Howard Taft, Taft had directed the U S embassy in Mexico to help overthrow Madero and put Huerta in power. But the new administration, Wilson, thought that that Huerta was too hot-headed and inconsistent to be trusted with American investments in Mexico. That's good old America for you. Take a sip just for America. Yep. Because we've been doing that with too many countries involving ourselves in their goddamn politics. It's so annoying. Oh, yeah. Especially in fucking Latin America. Jesus Christ. Yes, definitely Latin America, but it, it it I guarantee it's more than I guarantee we've had a the the Cuba is a big example. I'm sure there's other places that we, like we had a big role in where Japan is today too because we yeah that that's not getting to that but hey yeah so Wilson had initially placed an arms embargo on the Huerta government, um, but that expanded after so there's this rumor that the Empire of Germany was breaking the embargo and shipping weapons to Mexico in order to support the Huerta government. Interesting. I didn't know there was an embargo. Yeah, it's... It, Wilson put... Initially, he put an embargo in place in order to prevent Huerta from getting, like, foreign foreign aid, foreign military aid. Uh, but he, there was a rumor. It was, it was not true at all, but there was a rumor that Germany was breaking that embargo and shipping weapons to Mexico. And so Wilson sent a small fleet with a detachment of uh, U.S. Marines and attacked the port city of Veracruz. And they ended up occupying it and forcing the federal troops to retreat from eastern Mexico. And, and Veracruz ended up being occupied by the U.S. for like eight months. That was one of the few things that I actually learned about in like my high school history class. To be brutally honest, we didn't learn a whole lot about Mexico. Yes, like where it reached into the U.S., we learned a little bit about it. But um, 
Pancho Villa was pretty much written off from what I remember. Like, oh, he was a good kind of criminal, but he was still a criminal, blah, blah, blah. I'm not remembering perfectly well, but this is the vague understanding I remember. Yeah, it's crazy the idea that people have about uh, Pancho Villa in their minds in the U.S. Because Pancho Villa, he like he was a bandit before the revolution, but that's not what made him famous. What made him famous was the fact that he was one of the the most prominent and important leaders of the of the entire Mexican Revolution. He was a political and military leader. He was not his his reputation shouldn't be remembered as a bandit. It should be as a bandit who turned into a national figurehead. See, and the way it was described to me is like yeah, he was involved in the revolution, but he was still a bandit. He didn't really do much of note. He wasn't really that great, blah, blah, blah. This is me obviously paraphrasing because I barely remember that. Um, at at the end, I'll actually discuss like why, um, why he's remembered more as a bandit than as a revolutionary general um, in the U.S. So in May, in May of this year, uh, the Zapatistas besieged the capital of Morelos, Cuernavaca, while at the same time, a constitutionalist army under Pancho Villa and Alvaro Obregón marched south towards Mexico City. And remember that that second name, Alvaro Obregón? He's really, really important. He's, he's going to come up a lot. Okay. Alvaro Obregón? I'm going to take a sip for how much I brudged that on my end. <laughs> I know that was not a good pronunciation. Yeah, it's... O B R E G O N and the O has that little little accent mark on top of it. Alvero Obregón. Yeah, so there yeah, so the constitutionalists are marching south. The Zapatistas are seeing victory. And so Victoriano Huerta, the military dictator, resigns from the presidency, hops on a ship and flees to Europe just like Porfirio Diaz did. Fighting would continue for a few months. But the garrison of Mexico City finally surrendered to the Constitutionalist Army on August 17th. And then we get the cycle starting all over again. <laughs> Zapata and this, uh, this new guy, Carranza, which, by the way, uh, immediately, assumes, um, immediately assumes the presidential powers, so we could go ahead and take a shot for that. Huerta's out, Carranza's in. Yay, another shot. So this is President Four. Yep, Prost. Kampai. And this is, yeah, this is 1914. And from here on out, we're, we're going to have like one or two more, but it's going to be complicated, so I'll explain it. But Okay. But from here on out, Carranza is going to kind of be, kind of be one of, basically president, but it's going to get complicated. Okay. So Zapata and Carranza, as soon as, what does out of the picture? They immediately start butting heads. Zabata became more and more convinced that Carranza would become a second Madero and betray the revolution for personal ambition. And Carranza saw Zapata as a bandido with too high an opinion of himself. That sounds about right, unfortunately. Yeah, it was about this time that Zapata started regularly corresponding with Pancho Villa. How close were they? Like, did they get. Yeah, let's 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 talk about Pancho Villa for a second. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll explain what their relationship is. So his his actual name, Francisco Villa, had which actually was a name that he took when he was an adult. I can't I didn't put down what I can't remember, and I didn't put down what his birth name was. Which, by the way, there there's a lot of uncertainty about his past before he became an adult. Um, they're not even sure exactly what his birth name was, but. By the time he was in his bandit years, his name was Francisco Villa. He had been a bandit in the North Mexican states of Durango and Chihuahua for his entire adult life. His father had been a sharecropper working for an hacendado who had died when he was young. And like I said, we don't know much about his early years, but according to Villa himself, his life as a bandit began when he 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 murdered an asandado in Durango because the asandado had sexually assaulted his sister. I mean, they'd be lucky if 
that's all I did to them if they assaulted someone I love. Yeah, a sh- for somebody who commits a sexual assault, a gunshot wound is too quick a death. But anyways, so yeah, what's, after that he became an outlaw and he turned his banditry towards revolution when Madero's revolt began in 1910. And very, very quickly, he became one of the most prominent military commanders of the Northern Revolutionary Armies. And because of his poor working class background, he was very receptive to Zapata's platform of land reform and social revolution. And Zapata made a very good choice in aligning himself with Villa because on top of having probably the most powerful and successful revolutionary army in northern Mexico, at that time, Villa and Carranza, their relationship was deteriorating. Carranza didn't trust Villa because Villa was a former bandit, and Villa resented Carranza taking all of the authority of the revolution for himself after he and his cavalry had done all of the hardest work fighting against the Huerta government. Yeah, get... Pancho Villa's cavalry, fucking legendary amazing fighters insanely effective fighters did so much of it see they don't even talk about anyone outside of via like i literally know nothing about his t- i didn't even know he like regularly worked with people like it's uh it sounded like when they described it to me as a kid that it was just really poncho via was kind of like a solo bandit yeah, that's the impression that I got of that I had of him until a few years ago was that he was he was a bandit who was just such a good bandit that he became famous and that they never told any anything about his story. But no, he was a general. He was the general of an army and he was a national politician in Mexico during the revolution like. It, it baffles my mind, to be perfectly honest, that we can ignore how big of an impact someone had. So Zapata was also making alliances with several other like-minded people within the constitutionalist movement who thought that land reform was a good idea, including another powerful general named this guy named Lucio Blanco, who was actually the general who had captured Mexico City. They uh, they started to, to talk and they talked about how to compel Carranza to adopt the land reform into his platform, which he really didn't want to do. And if they couldn't convince him, they discussed how they could possibly get rid of him. So after this new government was put in place, there was a convention called in October, which gathered all it. It was meant to gather all the military leaders of the revolution together into one convention so that they could elect an interim president. So this is your president five. We'll get to that. Yeah. And Carranza was, he basically already had presidential power, but he was aiming to get the recognition for it through this convention. And one way that he wanted to do that was by making sure that Zapata had absolutely no recognition in this convention. He he wanted to ban Zapata completely from the proceedings of the convention. Damn. No. So the convention, but but he he couldn't force the con, the the other members of the convention were like, well, no, he's an equal participant in the revolution. He deserves a voice in what's going on here, and so they let Zapata's representatives in. So Carranza didn't get what he wanted, and so the convention began on October nineteenth, nineteen fourteen in the town of Aguascalientes, which is north of Mexico City. The convention went surprisingly well for the Zapatistas. They, the, the members of this convention elected to adopt most of the points of the plan of Ayala. And especially, they especially focused on the land reform provisions. Like everybody in the, in the revolution at this point were on board with, zapata's land reform ideas except for carranza oh really and so so they adopted these provisions and they also they they did this big thing 
they asked Carranza to step down from revolutionary leadership. They asked him to relinquish his power and to allow the convention to appoint a new revolutionary government. How did he take that? He fled to Veracruz with all of his closest supporters and started building a new army. Interesting. And so the civil war would continue. (laughs) So he's like, fuck y'all. And so now the revolutionary civil war is split between the constitutionalists under Carranza on one side and the conventionists who like after this convention, they're called the conventionists on the other side, which the two primary leaders of the conventionists are Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. And so once Carranza pulled out, Villa and Zapata both moved their forces into Mexico City and occupied it. And the two of them met for the first time on December 4th, 1914, in a schoolhouse in the village of... Okay, I, I'm i going to try this. I'm going to try to pronounce this. It has an X in it, which is really awkward in Spanish. But I looked it up before this, so I'm going to try to pronounce it. Xochimilco. Okay. I think that was close enough. <laughs> yeah, so the village of Xochimilco, which was south of Mexico City. That that sounds like something that you struggled to say in Spanish, Derek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's... Was that one or that was that three? I think that was three, right? I think no, that was one because the three is um, when you ask for. No, no. I think we switched it around. I think it was originally supposed to be. One, when I asked for clarification, three, when you struggle. No, what we switched around was whether it be three or five sips for clarification. I am pulling that up now because I'm pretty sure we screwed up the rules. I think that's what we did. Well, that's what we get for making up ad hoc rules. Uh, As it does. Hey, we can just say retroactively say, okay, I asked for clarity. It is one sip and we were doing three sips. You stumble over Spanish. It's three sips. Oh, shit. okay. So I have a proposal for you, Commissioner of Alcohol. I say we switch the rules around. Well, no, I propose. Uh, yeah, switch the rules, or not switch the rules around, but put them back where they were supposed to be. But um, since we are fucking them up, go ahead and finish our drinks. I've got. Mo- okay, we'll finish off first. Growing up, <laughs> <laughs> it's just an idea. But no, we're finishing off our current drink and opening a new one. Okay, so. By all accounts, this first meeting between Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata was very tense because neither one of them knew if they could really trust each other. Because, you know, it's revolutionary civil war. There's constant backstabbing. To be fair, it sounds like this was a lot of a lot of infighting that like there was it feels like there was a lot of I have to have exactly what I require even though it's different than my comrades to be dissatisfied. And it sounds like there wasn't a lot of agreement. Yeah. Keep, keep in mind the original goal of the revolution was to overthrow Porfirio Diaz, which they accomplished in a matter of months. The revolution went on for 10 years. That's crazy to have a 10 year revolution and still not be done. Even though you accomplished your task. Yeah, but eventually the two men were able to find common ground, especially over the fact that they both just fucking despised uh, Carranza. They hated that guy so much. And so they, they formalized their alliance against Carranza and Villa officially adopted the plan of Ayala as his political goal. With, with the exception of the parts of the plan, plan of Ayala, which, uh, which shit talked Francisco Madero, he left. He said, I, had, I, I accept the plan of Ayala, but I don't accept the part about Madero because via, like I said, he idolized Madero and he would idolize Madero until the day he died. So, yeah, for, for what that's worth. So even as the two leaders of the radical faction were making their alliance, fighting had already begun in the state of Puebla, which ended up, the Zapatistas ended up 
capturing it and were completely in control of the state of Puebla by New Year's of 1915. But Zapata was now stuck in a gridlock. He couldn't push the fight any further because the Zapatistas needed guns and ammunition, which they were chronically short of, and Villa had promised to provide them in order to invade Veracruz so that they could put down the cons because right now the constitutionalists are just in the city of Veracruz. They're the, that's the only area that they're even in like the, the rest of the country is controlled by the convention, but the, but Zapata couldn't push his offensive because he didn't have enough supplies for his army, which were promised by Pancho Villa, but none of them had arrived yet. And what, what neither Villa or Zapata knew at the time was that the sitting oh shit god damn it this is did you skip something or is this like a just a bad point well a, a bad way to introduce this but the convention that i mentioned at aguas calientes yes they elected a new interim president when carranza left does he become a permanent president he becomes an effective acting president over most of the country while Carranza is still like a symbolic president in his own mind. How long? How long did he become an acting? Uh, which one, Carranza or this guy? This guy. About a year. I was about to say six months to a year would be the, I would consider him a real president, so we take a shot. Okay. God damn it. I'm sorry, dude. Now I actually feel bad about this rule. I ain't feeling any pain right now. Are you? No. Yeah. So, yeah. So Zapata wasn't able to, um, Zapata wasn't able to invade Veracruz to finally put down Carranza and his movement against the convention government because none of the promised uh, supplies from Villa were arriving. And what they didn't know was that the sitting conventionist interim president, Eulalio Gutierrez, uh, which that that was our shot that we needed to do. Come by. Prost. Yeah. So the conventionist interim president, Eulalio Gutierrez, was secretly trying to weaken both Villa and Zapata so that he could raise his own standing within the conventionist government. Because at this point, he's kind of just like, he's not a figurehead government. Like he has political power. He's not fully recognized. He's fully recognized by the conventionist side, but a lot of the physical, like the actual practicable power is still in the hands of the military leaders, which is Villa, Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. And so he's trying to weaken both of them so that he can raise his own standing within the movement. And to as part of that, he's trying to turn Zapata and Villa against each other. And part of that is... Um, is interfering with the shipments of supplies that are supposed to be going to the Zapatista army. And then on top of that, at during this time, several of Zapata and Villa's generals within Mexico city, who over the course of this revolution, the, there's a whole bunch of people changing sides, and then when one side is beat, all of their generals will go and join other different factions. And that's been happening. I kind of assumed a lot of that was happening in the background, but it wasn't really coming up. Yeah. And so now, now that Zapata and Villa are allied with each other, a bunch of these generals who had been fighting against each other are now in close proximity with one another. And so during this time in Mexico City, there's this long... Wait, the way you were describing, excuse me, the way you were describing it before almost sound like Pancho Villa and Zapata were t already working together. Were they not? Were they kind of like people working on the same side, but not really directly together? What what was the case? So bef like before when Villa was still under Carranza, uh, when they're trying to overthrow Huerta, they were unofficially working together. Okay. But now that now that Carranza has declared against the convention, Villa and Zapata are now the official like leader or like the actual leaders of the conventionist government together in an alliance. So now they're like officially working together. Okay. So it was more like a under the table, bef 
not necessarily under the table, but like more low key thing before it. And then. Well, it was, it was like just out of circumstance before, just because they both happened to be against the Huerta government. And then Huerta was kicked out and was kicked out and beaten. And so now, now, uh, Via has, uh, Via has gone against Carranza and has allied himself with Zapata. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, before you... Definitely, and that's a clarification. That's one sip. Uh, but the way I was seeing it is like they were kind of working together, like full-on working together before, and I guess it wasn't like that from what I understand. Yeah, it... It's because of the distance and the fact that they couldn't like before, like back when they were fighting Huerta, um, Vio was just a general under Carranza. And so they're, they weren't like coordinating, like technically they had like an alliance because they were both fighting against Huerta at the same time, but it wasn't like official and they weren't like coordinating with one another. But now that Huerta's overthrown and Carranza has declared against the new conventionist government, um, Villa has aligned himself with the conventionist government and has officially allied with Zapata. And so now they're officially like coordinating and working together. Okay. Uh, but now they're all like, they've kind of thrown their armies together there in Mexico City. And a lot of these generals had been fighting against each other on different sides. And so they held a lot of grudges against one another. And so there is this long string of assassinations that suddenly happened between in between officers of the Via and Zapatista armies. And it, they just they literally just go out and they'd, they'd shoot somebody that they had a grudge against in the streets of Mexico City. <laughs> that doesn't sound super productive to be a perfectly honest it is not it is it was very counterproductive and it caused via and zapata to kind of wonder about one another like is he ordering these assassinations that's the thing about having a bunch of um underlings though is they'll go off and do stuff on their own but because you're associated they're gonna assume it was under your orders that's a uh, that's a catch 22 of like having associates, unfortunately. So at this point, Emiliano Zapata and his movement behind him are at the height of their power in revolutionary Mexico. So over the course of 1914, Zapata was bouncing around different towns, different, different towns and cities around Morelos, different pueblos, different settlements, um, and he was busy trying to meet the needs of his of the people who were under, who were living under Zap Zapatista control, and they he was also trying to reform his army because at this point it was just kind of like a loose collection of warlords, who kind of, who kind of, uh... you're cutting in and out really bad. I'm going to hit stop now. And we are live again at the Alexander Society podcast after our piss break. Okay, so so over the course of 1914, Zapata was bouncing around different towns around the state of Morelos. Ooh, excuse me. Around the state of Morelos, busy with trying to meet the needs of the people who lived under the Zapatista control and trying to reform his army to turn it from like a disorganized collection of warlords into like a centralized military command structure. He was also trying to implement land reforms, like the, the land reforms outlined in the plan of Ayala, uh, by confiscating Hacienda land and redistributing it to the campesinos. This was tough for two reasons. One reason, fighting was still going on with Carranza's forces. So in some parts of Zapatista ter territory, if they tried to redistribute land, there is a good chance that a constitutionalist army would just come through and give all of that land back to the Asandados. For another reason, without any of the promised aid coming in from the conventionists up north and Villa's army, Z the Zapatista army was basically being funded by protection money 
that they were extracting from Asandados that were in, within their territory. So they were kind of mafiosoing it up a little bit. Yeah, they they were they were pulling like weekly tributes from Asandados not to take all of their land. Like they were still taking some of their land to redistribute, but for the ones who paid them tribute money, they wouldn't take all of it. And that's basically how the movement was being funded at this point. And so they couldn't fully implement the redistribution of Asandado land because if they did, they'd lose their only source of income. And so this this continued on for for the rest of 1914. In in January of 1915, the conventionist provisional president, that guy Gutierrez, uh, he realized that he wasn't gonna be he was never going to be as powerful as Pancho Villa or Emiliano Zapata within the conventionist movement. No shit. It's why he doesn't appear on uh, banknotes in in Mexico. Um, But so when he, in January of 1915, he fled from Mexico city and he, left behind declarations saying that Zapata and Villa were both dictators who didn't allow the rightful government to, to govern and that they were holding political power for themselves. He's both right and wrong to be perfectly honest because they weren't letting things happen. But I guess from a historical standpoint, for good reason. Yeah. That's the thing is that the con, the conventionist government was always kind of weak and all of its legitimacy relied on the military strength of the army. And so of course the leaders of the army were going to always be the, we're always going to have the real practical power in that situation. But once Gutierrez fled, uh, the constitutionalist general that on that, that guy, that I told you to remember, Alvaro Obregón. He took this opportunity in a moment when the conventionist government was weak and discredited to go on the offensive. He ended up capturing the state of Puebla on January 5th and recaptured Mexico City on January 28th, forcing the Zapatistas to flee to Morelos and and forcing Villa's army to flee up north to Chihuahua. And so now that now that Gutierrez was gone, oh oh fuck. Another president. Uh now that Gutierrez was gone, one of Zapata's assistants, a man named Roque Gonzalez Garza, was named the new interim president. I would have liked a little warning so I could get my shot ready, you asshole. I wish I had had warning. <laughs> Did you just forget what you wrote in the script? I'm forgetting most everything right now. Come by. Prost. Oh, yeah. So, so the new interim president of the conventionist government is Roque Gonzalez Garza, a, a guy who is basically like an assistant to Zapata. So Zapata was able to retake Mexico City in March. And despite the fact that Carranza's General Obregón uh, was having success in central Mexico and that the conventionist government was still pretty shaky. The Zapatistas were still at the height of their power and their influence in this period from mid-1914 through mid-1915. There were no more haciendas left in Morelos. They had all been... Like other parts of Zapatista-occupied territory, there was still... Haciendas left, but in the state of Morelos, where the, where the Zapatistas were born, no more haciendas existed. They had all been broken up, and uh, the the plan of Ayala was being implemented all throughout the country, everywhere that the convention is controlled. But unfortunately for Zapata, it was not to last. This is this is the downslope now. We're the Zapatistas had have reached the height of their power. They literally control the like 90% of Mexico, but now it's all going downhill. Cooperation between the Zapatistas and Pancho Villa broke down. 
Zapata still wasn't receiving guns and ammo that Villa had promised, and Villa was pissed that the Army of the South wasn't doing more to assault constitutionalist bases and supply lines in central Mexico, which they couldn't really do because they didn't have any of the guns and ammo they were promised. Villa's army suffered several disastrous, just horrific defeats in the spring and summer of 1915, and they were forced to relocate their headquarters up to Chihuahua. So now, now the uh, the Villistas, Villa's army, is now completely like just pressed up against the border with the U.S. They're not able to operate in Central Mexico anymore. Damn that. That sounds like a hard, hard defeat for them. Like not defeat, defeat, but you know what I mean? Yeah. On top of that, the U.S. was making concerted diplomatic efforts to oppose Zapata and recognize the Carranza government. So in July of 1915, a constitutionalist push into the capital city sparked another wave of offensives on both sides and Mexico city was reoccupied by the constitutionalists on August 2nd. So now, and then, and then after that in October, uh, Carranza's forces captured the secondary conventionist capital in the town of Toluca. And now the convention was forced to disband. So now the conventionist government just doesn't exist anymore. And all of central Mexico is now controlled by the by Carranza's government and the constitutionalists. So now, basically, what that means is that Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, they can't communicate anymore. They're completely separated. So now each of them are on their own. During that period, people all over Zapatista territory began to suffer from food shortages and the relationship between Zapata's army and the local pueblos, which, which, which is what the whole movement was based on, the relationship between Zapata and his army and the local pueblos, that started to strain. But now that the Zapatistas were decoupled from national politics, there's no, there's no conventionist government anymore. And so the Zapatistas weren't, weren't compromising their vision in order to cooperate with the northern the the northern conventionists anymore and so now they were becoming more radical so 1915 and 1960 how radical are we talking uh, so a, so there's a rump government that was set up in Cuernavaca the capital of Morelos and it began organizing an agrarian plan that hugely expanded the process of land redistribution. So in the original plan of Viola, the plan of Viola is actually a lot less radical than a lot of people kind of remember, especially in Mexico. Um, the plan of Viola said, basically, so basically we're going to take a third of the land of all of the haciendas in Mexico and give them to the, and distribute them to the Mexican people. And then, and then the government is going to compensate them for the land that was taken. That that compromise was just kind of pitched out the window, and so now, um, land re, land redistribution was happening on like, like we're not just getting we're not just taking land from the asentados, we're getting rid of the haciendas Asen, altogether, which kind of had been happening in Morelos. But now it was happening all over Zapatista territory, which was basically from Morelos down south, like all of all like the bottom third of Mexico. They were they they weren't like compromising with haciendas anymore. They were just going in and taking the land and divvying it out. And on top of that, they were also beginning to this new rump government, which which for what it's worth was even though it wasn't as powerful as the conventionist government, it was still because it had the cooperation of Zapata, it was still able to enforce a lot of its legislation. Um, they were passing legislation, which pretty much at this point, now they were scrapping the federal system so that the, how so were they scrapping the federal system? 
So they were they were changing the way it works. So there weren't going to be state governments anymore. There weren't there wasn't going to be a central legislature and then the state governments that uh, that that elected representatives to the federal legislature. They scrapped that idea. And so now this new system was going to be based on like local town democracies. So regional regional municipal governments and they would decide laws based on plebiscites, which were just uh, anytime a law would be up for uh, up for ratifying, uh, it would be put to a popular vote. So basically, the bottom third of Mexico during this period, 1915, 1916, was probably the most radical democracy that existed in the world at the time. <laughs> It's really, it's really kind of wild, and of course, it was like it was really complicated because it it wasn't always democratic because like that Zapata still had a crazy amount of power and he was still like not consciously a dictator. He wasn't trying to be a dictator because one thing I will commend Zapata for: he never wanted political power, even when he had it, he didn't want it. He was constantly trying to get rid of it, but he still had it and he still exercised it and and to his credit exercised it in the interest of the people that he was uh that he that his army can ruled over but the fact remains he still ruled over people so he was kind of still a dictator but at the same time the government that he was kind of influencing and controlling was passing these policies that basically made their territory the most radical democracy on the planet even by today's standard the most kind of crazy that we can say hey this historical event you barely heard of is pretty radical even compared to today that should that shouldn't be a thing to be perfectly honest right yeah um it's it's actually coming back to the anarchist it's actually speculated um Zapata had always had like an interest in municipal democracy and restoring political power to the pueblos, but he had kind of sacrificed that vision in favor of in favor of preserving political power for the movement within the federal system that was already set up in Mexico so that he could push through the land reform, which was the main focus of his movement. But now that that now that national politics was basically unreachable by the zapatistas he um it speculated whether that was whether these these sorts of revolutionary changes were a result of zapata himself or a result of like the anarchist influence that was kind of starting to become more prominent in these later years within the movement uh, anarchists, of course, like very big on the idea of like regionable decentralized democracy and that kind of thing. But either way, these reforms help shore up the popular support for them for Zapatismo for the time being. So, no matter what else was going on, Zapata and his movement wasn't going anywhere. Unfortunately for him, though, that didn't really help much. The army, the Zapatista army was being weakened by desertions. And in May 1916, the Constitutionalist army swept through and captured all the major settlements in Morelos, forcing the Zapatistas back into the mountains. So that once again, back where they started. Back to square one, my comrade. Back, back to square one. Carranza, Carranza and his army, his his little fucking dinky army was holed up in the city of Veracruz. That's the only part of Mexico they controlled. And because of petty bickering and infighting within the conventionist conventionist government who controlled 90, 95% of the country, were not able to crush this little itty bitty fucking speck on the map of the country. And as a result, it was allowed to grow and fester. And now, and now the the conventionists are gone, 
and the two factions that made it up are on the back burner and dying out. It's 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 mind boggling the way that this revolution went. So the Zapatista army was being weakened by desertions. And in May 1916, the Constitutionalist army. I, yeah, I said that. So Carranza's army began a string of massacres against civilians suspected of supporting Zapata, as is usual. That's what happens whenever somebody occupies Morelos during this time. And so, so even, but so they were, they were basically where they were at the start of the revolution now, back to square one. But now they didn't have the benefit of like revolutionary enthusiasm amongst the populace. That was all gone. People were just tired of fighting. They didn't want to fight anymore. There wasn't any enthusiasm about overthrowing the government anymore. But amongst the Zapatista leadership, there were, they still had fight in them. Their tried and true guerrilla tactics were still wreaking havoc on the constitutionalist army. And this army that was now in Morelos, it was under a general named Pablo Gonzalez. And Gonzalez's army was decimated in a year of fighting, both from Zapatista raids and from disease in the tropical climate. And on top of that, he... he Gonzalez had was in kind of a political rivalry with his counterpart in the north, Obregón. And that meant that uh, that Gonzalez, because he was a significantly weaker political operative than Obregón was, he was getting significantly less of the portion of the supplies from the can- constitutionalist like stockpile. And so his army was chronically undersupplied. Isn't couldn't you argue that most revolutionary armies were undersupplied, be it monetarily or literally? Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's a common trend. Every no matter what side you're looking at in the the Mexican Revolution, it's pretty pretty common thing to read. Like, and they they were suffering from shortages of supplies, which weakened weakened their ability to win such and such battle or whatever. That, that's a pretty common thing. And it's because Mexico just was not did didn't have the industrial base, and whatever industrial base they did have was severely depleted by the fighting on their own home turf, and and they they just didn't have a lot of options for getting getting stuff from outside the country because nobody nobody gave the only people who gave a shit about Mexico were Germany and the U.S. and they were not. The, Germany wasn't helping any side really at all, even though they like they diplomatically dealt with them a lot. And then the U.S. were mainly focused on like either weapons embargoes, which would keep the kind of weapons that they needed to actually fight their battles out, or just straight up invasions and occupation of Mexican territory. So, yeah, the. There was a in a time when people needed guns the most. There was a severe shortage of guns. How was this? Did they just not have enough guns in Mexico, or was there a pile up? What? Yeah, there's just not enough. There weren't enough guns in Mexico, and there wasn't there wasn't enough like industrial capacity to provide the amount of guns that they needed to keep up their armies. Okay. Basically, just not enough supply for the demand. Yeah, even even at the development level that they got to under Porfirio Diaz, Mexico still wasn't developed enough. They they're still a pretty poor country, so they just didn't they didn't have the capacity to produce guns or ammunition or anything else that they needed to run an army in the levels that they needed during a civil war like this. So. So Gonzalez's army in Morelos was he was forced to pull his army out in November of 1916. An army of 30,000 by the way, which is fucking enormous for Mexico at that time. And by that time the Zapatista army of the south had shrunk from 25,000 at its height in 1914 to just around 5,000. That's a the it, that's an insane level of manpower loss. 
it at their at the height of their military capability in 1914, they had 25,000 soldiers in the Zapatista army. And by the end of 1916, they had 5,000. And but they were still kicking ass. It's it's fuck it's fucking crazy. And so by the end of the first month of 1917, by the end of January 1917, Zapata's troops had reoccupied Cornovaca. So even in this even in this downslide of power and authority within the revolution, they were still making like some decent like decent headway and had some victories under their belt. During the occupation by the constitutionalists, Morelos, the state of Morelos had been completely devastated. Uh, Carranza's reprisals and their policy of forced relocation of suspected Zapatista sympathizers left a bunch of settlements, like pop, their populations depleted. The city of Cuernavaca itself, the capital of the state, the largest city in Morelos, when when the Zapatistas reoccupied it, they only had three families left living in the city. And so Zapata ended up having to turn his army to on the defensive because now they had to focus all of their resources on rebuilding Morelos. So just a fucking a clusterfuck. The Zapatistas are in a clusterfuck right now. <laughs> even even when they win, they're fucking losing. So during this period, uh, Emiliano Zapata had suffered several losses, like personal losses. What personal losses did he suffer? I'm getting to that. Didn't sound like you were, but do continue. Uh, in March of 1916, one of Zapata's oldest friend, literally a childhood friend, and who was also one of his generals, a guy named Francisco Pacheco, Pacheco tried to defect to Carranza's army. And when and when Zapata found out, he ordered him killed. And so Pacheco literally a Zapata don't play. Yeah, Zapata did not fuck around with this shit. He fuck around to find out, my dude. Yeah, literally Zapata some of Zapata's guys walked into Pacheco's Pacheco was staying in like a farmhouse. And they literally walked into the bedroom where he was sleeping and shot him in his bed while he was sleeping. And even though he ordered the killing, like it still fucking affected him because this was one of his childhood friends. Um, and then another old friend of his, a guy named Otilio Montano, who had actually, he was the guy who wrote down the original draft of the plan of Ayala. And he was an old friend of Zapata's. Montano was accused of conspiring with the other guy, Pacheco. He was court-martialed and he was sentenced to death by firing squad in May of 1917. And then the last, the really big one, the really important one, uh, Zapata's brother, Eufemio Zapata, his older brother, who was also... That's a weird name. Like... I know I don't know Spanish very well, but Euphemio? Yeah, Euphemio. Feels like a weird name. I don't know. I don't... I guess because I don't speak Spanish, I don't have, like... Honestly, same. Like, since we neither one of us know Spanish, it, it's probably a weird name to us, but not a weird thing in the grand scheme of things of that language, you know what I mean? But, yeah, so uh, Zapata's it's his older brother, but he's a general under Zapata, which in my my drunken brain is kind of hard to parse out. Like he's the older brother, but he's still subordinate to Emiliano. I to be fair, I feel like that's a Western thing. Or because I feel like eldest brother being the leader or the in charge is more of a Western thing because we're always like, well, the um, eldest sibling inherits everything according to that. And that's not a thing everywhere, but it happens. It, and it, and throughout history, there's plenty of times where the eldest sibling did not inherit it. Uh, whatever was in, whatever was in, 
question, whether it be a title, whether it be land, whether it be power. Yeah. Oh, whatever, whatever the case. Uh, so Euphemio Zapata, Emiliano's older brother, who is also a general, he was a bit of a drunk, especially in this this period. He'd really gotten gotten into his dependency. What was he dependent on? Alcohol. Booze is a nice lady. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I said booze is a nice lady. But yeah, he got drunk and he beat the father. So he got into an argument and ended up beating the father of another Zapatista general. Not another Zapatista, but not another Zapatista general, but another Zapatista general's father. So what you're saying is he didn't beat up another person who was in the um um revolution but he beat up someone whose father was the revolution yeah he the father of another general in this army that's so dumb yeah and so in revenge that other general shot and killed euphemio in june of 1917 that's so dumb which he had it coming and even emiliano himself he agreed that Euphemio had it coming, but it was still like it was his brother, still fucking depressing. Uh, so that happened in June 1970. And that was a really big deal because Euphemio was kind of considered like the second hero of Zapatismo. Like behind Emiliano was Euphemio. Interesting. He, he was kind of not the second in command, but like the second son of the movement. So the second golden child, basically not in second command, not not in charge of anything, but like the second person people thought of ideologically. Yeah, he was he was one of the he was a prominent ideological leader and he was a, one of Euphemio's big strengths within the movement was he was a really good recruiter. And a lot of people were brought into the Zapatista cause by his example. But during this period when the when the Zapatistas started to lose and he started to become more of an alcoholic, he was uh, it, it, it his alcoholism culminated in this incident, which ended up getting him killed. And and it was it wasn't just a- damn his alcoholism got him killed. It be. Yeah, it's his... Oh, God, what am I trying to say? Fuck. Apologies for derailment. Nah, you're good. But, yeah, so he's he's like the second son of the Zapatista revolution. And one of, one of its most important and most public ideological figures. And he's just been killed in this completely shameful act. And that general who shot him ended up in order to to, prov- to keep from facing uh, Emiliano's wrath, ended up defecting to Carranza's army. So just another defection, another weakening of the Zapatista army. That was in June 1917. Emiliano Zapata had already become naturally distrustful of other people just by the natural backstabbing that went along with civil wars. But all of these losses specifically during this period made him deeply paranoid and withdrawn. And that wasn't helped by another thing that happened. So Carranza's government, once they reoccupied Mexico City and retook control of like the the symbolic presidency, if that makes sense, they took that opportunity and they drafted a new constitution in January of 1917. And keeping with Carranza's... I have a feeling there's a new president coming? Not yet. Not yet. It's still just Carranza. Carranza, he's... He's re... <laughs> it, it feels like there should be. Because... Yeah, he was... There was basically this period where between the constitutionalists and the conventionists where there were like two presidents. It was Carranza and there's the whatever other guy the conventionalist conventionists had but now Carranza has reclaimed Mexico City and he has 
he is now both symbolically and practically the once again the reigning president of Mexico. Uh, so they took this. He took this opportunity and and ordered a new new convention, a constitutional convention that would draft a new constitution, and that became the Mexican Constitution of 1917. Which, fun fact, is the same constitution that Mexico is still under to this day. Nice. Interesting that... What year was this specifically? 1917. Mm, Not as old as I thought, but like, I'm kind of surprised that their constitution stood as long as it does. Because our constitution gets amended as much. We don't know much about... I personally, at least, don't know much about how... Uh, Mexico's constitution works. I don't know if they get amended as much or not. It's yeah, it's, it works different. It's going to work different just because of differences in history. It's going to work differently because like this constitution very much has like ideological roots in earlier Mexican constitutions, especially the really big important one, which is the constitution of 1857. That's the big important constitution in Mexican history that all all other like all other political ideologies in Mexico after that are trying to like model themselves on. And that's what the Constitution of 1917 was modeled on as well. So you can kind of see the Constitution of 1917 is just an improvement on the Constitution of 1857. But it it yeah so anyways but this this new constitutional convention despite Carranza's protests they ended up including an article in it i think it was article 27 i didn't put it down but it's not important the exact number but there's an article that guaranteed the legal protection of land holdings for campesinos which is, it's not as far as the Zapatistas wanted, but it was basically what they wanted. And it's what a lot of the campesinos were after. Not specifically the Zapatistas, but just generally campesinos were after. And so as a result, a lot of pueblos in Zapatistas' territory started to defect to Carranza's cause. Because now, because now Carranza was not not by his own will but his government was now offering the exact land reform that they were looking for and on top of that now it seemed like Carranza was on the had the upper hand and his government would end up winning the civil war and they a lot of these pueblos and these campesinos were just desperate for the fighting to end can you blame them to be honest like how long has this been going on uh no. This is 19... Seven years. Seven years out of our ten years file. I would be fucking done at that point. I'm not gonna lie. I, w- I would be tired of this shit. Absolutely. No, I do not blame any of them at all. Even though I am... Ideologically, I very much support Emiliano Zapata and his movement. But practically imagining myself as a person on the ground, I don't blame them at all. They were tired. They they were done. They were done with this shit. Like at that point, I would be too. Yeah, it, it's the same choice I would make in that position. I I don't blame them at all. But despite all of these setbacks, it's the weirdest thing. This is the strangest part of Emiliano Zapata's personality. Is that with all of these overwhelming defeats, he was still unsettlingly hopeful about the future. Um, he's got a brighter disposition than I do. Yeah, it's and I've seen some of the research that I did. I've seen kind of attributed it to his like his rural machismo, like that this this masculinity type of thing that he was trying to fulfill is that even in the face of overwhelming odds, he still felt the need to present a face of just equally overwhelming optimism. So Zapata started to reach out to other. So 
it wasn't just Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata that were rebelling at this point. There were other groups, especially in Western Mexico, that were uh, rebelling against Carranza's government. And he started to reach out to some of these unaligned rebel armies. And even uh, former former officers in the in the army of Porfirio Diaz, like former supporters of Porfirio Diaz, he started to reach out to them to see if they could add any strength to the Zapatista army. And then another thing that was happening at this time, this was fall of 1917. The United States had recently joined World War I. They had recently gotten involved. And so Zapata started to reach out to the German Empire in order to try and buy and try and get them to give them guns be, by pointing out and saying that we're fighting against Carranza. Carranza is supported by the U.S. government and the U.S. is currently fighting against you. So it'd be in your interest to help us. And it, it ended up not working. Germany never gave them guns, no matter what fucking war hawks in the 1910s would tell you. But the, Germany was never giving Mexico any guns. But anyways, but yeah, so why did Germany not want to give uh, Mexico guns? Before the U.S. entered the war, they... Germany didn't really, generally speaking, in Germany's government, they didn't really think that they had a need to reach out to to Mexico, especially while it was in the middle of a civil war, because it was so far away, and they didn't really have any reason to believe that the United States would become involved in the war, which is which would be the only reason to ever reach out to any faction within the Mexican civil wars. And then after the U.S. got involved, at that point in the war, Germany was so pressed for, uh, so strained on their need to send guns to the front line that they didn't have any to spare, even if they wanted to give any to any faction. So they were already stretched thin, is what you're saying? Right. So there was, there's never any any opportunity that Germany had or that Germany that Germany ever wanted to actually help any faction in the Mexican Civil War, they didn't have the means to actually help them. So it it ended up being a pointless venture for the Zapatistas. And so all of Zapata's hope and all of his efforts were ultimately for nothing. He did end up securing alliances with several other rebel groups in Central Mexico. And for a while, it there's this weird i'm not going to get into the specifics but there's this weird chain of events where there were certain people within the american state department that were actually started to come out in support of Zap- Z- the zapatistas um and it so it was looking like they might have might be making headway and in, in g- gaining american recognition for their faction and american support but by the end of 1918 the new federal armies from so now that the now that the constitutionalists had taken retaken the federal seat uh these the Carranza's armies were uh making were starting to make more headway into Zapatista territory uh pueblos and soldiers alike were both deserting in droves. And then on top of that, in November of 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic hit Mexico like a fucking train. Just in the Zapatistas territory, specifically in Morelos, 25% of the population of Morelos was killed by Spanish flu. A quarter of the population. God damn that's a lot yeah and so and after after this the first wave of the spanish flu came through zapata's army was down to about two thousand soldiers how did he go on after that he didn't (laughs) i'm getting to it thank god he didn't (laughs) because i was like how the fuck does someone recover from somehow 
Somehow, inexplicably, Zapata was still holding on to a desperate, irrational hope for victory. At this point, even his closest friends were saying, this is fucking hopeless. We don't, we, there's no way for us to win anymore. But he was just still pushing forward. And he was still working to organize his troops and to address the needs of the civilian, the few civilians that were still under his leadership. And now, now we get to the end of his his story. So, how does Zapata's or story end? In March of 1919, there is a colonel in Carranza's army. This colonel was serving under that guy I mentioned earlier, Pablo Gonzalez. This guy's name was Jesus Guajardo. Guajardo secretly sent a letter to the Zapatistas telling them that he intended to defect to the Zapata's cause. And he informed them that he would bring 5,000 troops and a fresh shipment of guns and ammunition with him. And as a show of good faith, when he defected, he attacked another Car- Carranza army uh unit capturing and executing 60 troops so this is going somewhere i promise so after this guajarda and his unit fled from the rest of the rest of carranza's army and they ended up and guajarda ended up meeting zapata at a train station in uh oh sorry i read that wrong um but they uh, they they ended up meeting at an hacienda in the village of Chinameca in Morelos, in the state of Morelos, on April 9th, 1919. The next morning, April 10th, 1919, Guajarda invited Emiliano Zapata to inspect his troops, about 150 of them. And they were stationed out in the Hacienda courtyard in formation, waiting for Zapata to come and give the inspection. What follows next, I'm going to give in the words of one of the Zapatistas, a man named Alvarez Reyes, who relayed in a letter to another Zapatista what happened on that day. April 10th, 1919. Quote, As he approached the gate, the guard appeared ready to do him honors. The bugle sounded three times, the call of honor, and when the last note fell silent as the general arrived at the threshold in a manner most treacherous, most cowardly, most villainous, at point-blank range without giving him time even to clutch his pistols, the soldiers who were presenting arms fired their rifles twice. And our General Zapata fell, never to rise again. Damn. So this guy from the Carranza army faked a defection, which involved the summary execution of 60 of his own guys in order to gain Zapata's trust. And then when Zapata showed up to meet his troops... Under the pretext of giving him a salute, they pulled their rifles and shot him off his horse. April 10th, 1919, Emiliano Zapata was dead. Damn. The movement disintegrated without their leader. I'm not surprised, not gonna lie. Yeah, no, he was he was the guy. His he just through sheer force of will, he was holding together the movement at this point. Fighting ended up continuing into the next year, but by the start of 1920, there was little left of the Zap- of Zapatismo as a as a movement besides the dream and a few scattered generals with a handful of troops still hiding in the mountains. In 1920, it became clear that the first full-term revolutionary president. So the first president since the revolution started to serve a full term, Venustiano Carranza, it became clear that he wasn't going to be reelected. He was being criticized throughout Mexico for being unable to end the fighting during his presidency and for failing to address the economic devastation of the civil wars. 
his former commander in chief, that guy I told you to remember, Alvaro Obregón. He was running against Carranza and was predicted to beat him in a landslide. And so in a last ditch attempt to protect his own power, Carranza announced that the elections would be postponed. But the problem was Obregón had the loyalty of the army. In May 1920, Olvero Obregón marched the federal army on Mexico City and ousted Carranza. That sounds about right. Yeah. His march on Mexico City was joined by the two new leaders who stepped up in the Zapatista movement, two generals named uh, Gildadio Mahaña and Yenovivo de la O, which they're important, but not you don't don't bother worrying. Don't bother remembering them. They're not going to come up again. I'm almost done, I promise. So Carranza, now ousted, he f- he fled to Veracruz, just like he had done before with the convention. Oh, yeah, this is a change of president. Prost. Come by. So Carranza, he fled to Veracruz and he tried to build a new army, which, if he had been successful, probably would have dragged the civil wars on for even longer. But before he even got a chance to do that, he was assassinated. And so now Carranza is dead. And Obregón is now the president. And with Carranza's death, finally, finally, after 10 years, the Mexican Revolution and the Civil Wars were now over. And by a sheer stroke of luck, the remainder of what was left of the Zapatistas were members of the winning coalition. Now, granted, they had significantly less influence than they once had. So, yeah, the Zapatistas, even though they had less, they had significantly less influence than they once had, like in 1916, they were still part, they ended up on the winning side of the civil wars. And To Obregón's credit, he did begin a program of land distribution, and it became a basic part of the Mexican government's policy for decades after. It wasn't to the extent that the Zapatistas wanted, and it had its own share of problems and its own set of, its own corruption inherent in it. But It was at least there, and that was enough for a lot of the remaining campesinos. Uh, But over the coming decades, with the under the government that Obregón finally established at the end of the revolution, they under they focus more on a program of industrial development and urbanization, and just through sheer cultural force and economic force, the Campesinos of Morelos ended up dying out in the 20th century. And so the home state of Zapatismo and of Emiliano Zapata himself, the Campesinos no longer exist there because of the results of the Mexican Revolution. So, and after, so, okay, yeah. So let, let, I'll explain a little bit. A little bit of what what came after. So there were other conflicts. There are other civil conflicts in Mexico after the revolution. Obregón himself, uh, at the end of his second term as president in 1928, he announced that he was going to be running for a third term. And so a lot of people in the military were afraid that he was going to become another Porfirio Diaz. And so there was an attempted military coup that tried to overthrow him in 1928, which ended up failing, and a lot of the ringleaders were executed. And then his election was successful, and he was reelected, but right after, but before he could take office, he was assassinated. Again, in 1928. Jesus Christ, another president died. 
I I will not if you if you as the uh, rules executive decide not to call this because it's after the main story. This is just a wrap up. If you decide not to call it, then I will respect that. Was it in the 10 year period you claimed was part of what we were covering? Was it in that 10 years? Then it does not count in my opinion. No, this is eight years. Okay, I I will respect that. So, Obergon's successor, who is another another revolutionary general, his name was Plutarco Elias Calles. He ended up being even more radical than Obergon was. Oh, really? Now, he was deeply anti-clerical and anti-religious. And he instituted a bunch of laws during his presidency that cracked down on the ability for Catholics to practice their faith in a country where in a country where 98 percent of the people were practicing Catholics. How did that go over with his people? It is the entire country rose up against him. Honestly, I'm not surprised. It was. The re- that rebellion in the 1920s and the 1930s, it came to be called the Cristero War. As it should be. And when I when you go and look up the Cristero War, it literally frames it as the Mexican government under Calles versus the actual Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't blame you for going to war with the Catholic Church. No matter who you are, uh, it's it's complicated because I don't like Caez. I think he was a bit of a bastard, and I think that the the poor people of Mexico have a right to practice their faith, um, even despite my very reasonable criticisms of the Catholic Church. Honestly, the Catholic Church has plenty of issues within it. If you want to take out the uh, priest uh, little boy thing. Yeah, even but even that, like, I'm not going to begrudge somebody for practicing their faith. I'm not, like, my criticisms of the organization of the church have no bearing on the theology of the church and the, the beliefs of the people who practice the Catholic faith, which is, and that that is, let this let's not confuse though. You can have questions upon the theology that also do co- confuse the um, that put into question the theology of it, because there are certain things. I'm not saying one way or the other that would put into question the theology of the Catholic faith. Right. Yeah, and I don't disagree with that, but at the same time, like I. I am not going to begrudge somebody their faith. Oh, I never said there was a begrudging. Like, you can notice holes or issues with the faith, even if you're not condemning it or saying it's outright wrong. Especially in the context of Latin America and like places like Mexico, Guatemala, a few other, a few other places, the Catholic church at least the in, the institutions of the church that exist within their countries have played a very significant role in very important like progressive liberatory uh pr- um like projects and and protest and reform and things like that um in like in the Cristero War, I would 100% take the side of the people who are fighting against the Calles government because because it wasn't just a it wasn't just a religious thing. It wasn't just because their their religion was being stifled by the by the government. It was because the govern the governmental structure itself was becoming so authoritarian intrinsically, and that authoritarianism was infringing on people's right to practice their faith as they as they choose and so in that con and and so in that context i think 
the church's position on it within Mexico was 100% right. And then in, uh, there are other examples like uh, like in the 1970s and 80s during the during the Civil War in Guatemala, the Catholic Church took a strong stance against the military dictatorship and figures like uh, Oscar Romero, um, the, the Archbishop of Guatemala, who um, was a strong a strong advocate against the military dictatorship and its abuses against the Guatemalan people. And so it, in specific contexts, I think that the Catholic Church has has been a force for good. And even as I have my very stern and real criticisms of the organization and its structure as a whole, and for the very real harm that it has done in a lot of cases around the world and historically. So for what... For what that's worth, the civil conflicts were eventually resolved and the government was the the revolutionary government was never overthrown. And by 1946, the nation had politically and socially stabilized. Uh, Plutarco Callez had founded a new political party, which sought to preserve the gains of the revolution and to protect the country of Mexico from reactionary counter-revolution. He called this party the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the Spanish acronym PRI. Mexico would remain a one-party state under the PRI until they were defeated in the presidential race. I want you to guess the year that the PRI was finally defeated in a presidential race. How long were they a one-party state? 98 very close 2000 what the fuck i thought i was going too far i thought i was getting too modern nope 2000 was the year that they that the pri was finally um finally beat in a in a presidential race okay real briefly i'm going to cover Pon- i'm going to catch up with pancho villa real quick cuz i think he's an important part of this story Pancho Villa's armies were completely destroyed by Obregón's assaults in 1916. With less than 500 soldiers left in his army, and in a last-ditch attempt to rally the demoralized people of northern Mexico back to his cause, he hatched a plan. A plan that would make him famous and notorious in American history. How bad was this plan? His plan was to goad the United States into invading Mexico. What the fuck? And we don't talk about this a lot nowadays, but he succeeded in that. He goaded the U.S. into invading Mexico? So what he did was he took 50 guys and he went over the border into New Mexico and he he raided the border town of Columbus. In the process, a few of the citizens of Columbus were killed. Their bank was raided. A bunch of people had their property stolen. And if not stolen, then it was burned down. And in response to this, the American public was outraged and the Wilson administration was forced to respond. And so Wilson sent in the U.S. Army on a punitive expedition to hunt down Pancho Villa. And then when the American army crossed over the border the Mexican population of the North were completely outraged at this complete breach of Mexico's sovereignty. And so they rallied. No, duh. Yeah. And so they rallied to Pancho Villa's banner in order to push the Americans out. And so, and so Villa was able to rebuild his army from literally nothing. The guy was a genius, but also a fucking maniac. (laughs) I love Pancho Villa so much. To be fair, Derek, how many people can be a genius and a fucking maniac at the same time throughout history? So many times. Um, it it happens very few times, but when it does, they become legendary. Unfortunately for Pancho Villa, it, it, rebuilding his army still wasn't enough. 
And as his Zapatista allies in the south were being eaten up by Carranza's armies. So as the Zapatistas in the south were being eaten up by Carranza's armies, he was forced to fight a desperate guerrilla war in the deserts of northern Mexico. And that that guerrilla war carried on until Obregón came to power. Once Obregón was in power, Villa was successfully able to negotiate a peace settlement with the new government. And he finally laid down his rifle for good. In recognition of Villa's service to the revolution, he was granted a 25,000-acre hacienda in his home state of Chihuahua. But Obregón still considered him a political threat, even though even though Villa had basically settled down for a quiet, like he was done. He was completely out of politics. He did not care anymore. He was now rich. He had the big farm and he was ready to settle down. He was pacified at this point. Yes. But Obregón still thought that he was still a potential threat to his political power. And so Obregón ordered him to be assassinated. Fuck Obregón. And fuck Obregón. And so Pancho Villa was killed when his car was ambushed by assassins sent by President Obregón in the town of Peral in Chihuahua on July 20th, 1923, just three years after the revolution ended. Emiliano Zapata came to be recognized as a national hero in Mexico. As he should be. As he should be. He has statues in his honor all over the country, and his face has appeared on Mexican banknotes several times. None of the none of the current runs of the peso bills have his face on it, but past past series have. Do theirs work a lot like our quarters do, or what? Yeah, like, like they'll they'll put out new series with new designs on the bills and the coins. Um, so it, it changes like our quarters do, and our bills don't stay the, the same. Unfortunately, I think our bills should change. To be perfectly honest, yeah, I think we should put other like American figures on our bills. I think we should, especially with how. Um, problematic some of our figures are oh yeah fucking never let in andrew jackson's face shouldn't show up in a fucking history book never mind a dollar bill andrew jackson should be erased from history not literally but he should be relegated to the point where we vilify to the point where you don't want to talk to him about him and like oh that was that piece of shit who did this horrible thing and should have never been president and it was a very bad mistake but we don't yeah his deeds should be remembered but his face should die and be forgotten to history and it makes no sense that we have benjamin franklin on any of our bills or alexander hamilton to be perfectly honest um yeah so he's a he's a national hero in mexico but among the poor farmers and the rural indigenous communities of southern Mexico specifically, he's not just a hero, he's almost a demigod. He has like a mythical status amongst the people of southern Mexico. I'd argue a lot of our family fathers at this point are treated like a mythical status, even if they're not. Um, but specifically, like... For for example, there's a popular urban legend amongst some of the communities in southern Mexico that Zapata never actually died. They the urban legend goes that Zapata actually lived on, and that after after the end of the Mexican Revolution, he went around, he traveled abroad around the world, and participated fighting for the liberty and the and the liberation of people across the planet. Which is a nice idea, but unrealistic. No, we, we know for, there's pictures of his body. We know for a fact that he died, but the, this urban legend still, 
still lives on in some parts of southern Mexico. That e- there are even even some versions of the legend that he is actually still alive today, and that he still you can still find him in with a rifle in hand fighting on the side of oppressed people wherever they're striking back against their oppressors. Yeah, how delusion do you got to be? Like, there's no way he's still alive, even if you want to be realistic about it. Well, in spirit, yes. I understand the the idea of spirituality and the idea behind it, but fit actually being alive, no. I think that's really like the the root of the legend is that his his spirit really does live on and in some cases his legacy lives on in more of a concrete form than just urban legends so this is the last thing i have before we leave out in 1991 that was 71 years after the end of the Mexican Revolution, the PRI government was still in power and they announced that they had amended the 1917 Constitution, the Revolutionary Constitution, and they repealed the article that protected the rights of Campesino landowners. Shitty move on their part. Shitty move. This was done in preparation for the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. The intention was that they would be opening up Mexican agricultural land to foreign American investment. And just as it had been done in the days of the Porfiriato, a century before that, what that would mean would be the displacement and the impoverishment of Mexico's remaining free farmers, their remaining campesinos. Because there were still campesinos. The ones that were left were mostly native descended people in southern Mexico. And so, on January 1st, 1994, on the day that NAFTA went into effect, a group of indigenous Mayan militants in the state of Chiapas, which is the farthest southern state in Mexico, this group was called the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. And they rose in revolt against the Mexican government. They fought with the Federal Army of Mexico for 12 days before a ceasefire was called, which resulted ultimately resulted in 153 deaths. In response to the uprising, the government agreed to grant these new Zapatista communities in Chiapas autonomous status. As they should. Yes. And to this day, I I cannot emphasize enough, they still exist. To this day, the rebel Zapatistas of Chiapas still live in a communal agrarian lifestyle. And their communities still practice a radical, direct democracy through community assemblies just like what was practiced in the dark early days of the dissolution of the convention in 1916, 1917. These Zapatista communities in Chiapas are still a constant thorn in the side of the Mexican state, and they are a constant reminder to Mexican society that Emiliano Zapata's demand, Tierra y Libertad, in English, land and liberty, that that demand is still just as relevant now as it was in the dark days of the revolution one century ago. Jesus. And that, that is what I have for 
this episode? Honestly, I don't have too many comments on that because I I didn't know shit about him to begin with, but like uh, on Zapata, but Pancho Villa is in a whole new light for me. Like Pancho Villa was just not literally how they described him, but in essence, they described him as a thug who was revolutionary for a little bit and then continued to be a, like a robber thug. Like they, they didn't have any respect in my history class for him. I, I had not, I did not even know the Mexican revolution was a thing until after I graduated from high school. I still barely know anything about the Mexican revolution other than what you just told me, obviously. Yeah. And I, I covered the broad strokes and most, and most everything I covered was in the, there's a lot more that goes into it. Like, um, Oh, I'm sure. I still haven't even scratched the surface of how complicated this conflict was. Isn't that a lot of topics in history though? Oh yeah. Like there's so many topics that are just like, Oh, I haven't even started. Oh man. If I ever get to the fucking Russian revolution, Oh my God, how fucking complicated that'll be. But Oh, I'm sure. Um, so real quick, the sources that I use for this are the, the two sources that I use for this, um, two books. One was Emiliano Zapata revolution and betrayal in Mexico by Samuel Brunk. And the other one was Zapata and the Mexican revolution by John Womack jr. Any thoughts before we go, Derek? I hope that through this, I have helped open up more American people's eyes to the possibility of seeing the Mexican people as more than just, just the political talking point that they are currently in American discourse and in the American zeitgeist. So that that's what I have, Tim. Um, I kind of uh, gave you all my thoughts. Where can they find you on social media? They can find me on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one. The O is a zero. Uh, Tim, what's our uh, what's all of our stuff that you usually say? Well, they can find me at Tim, a.k.a. Otis, at Twitter. And they can find the podcast on Twitter at Alex Society Pod and Facebook and Instagram at The Alexander Society Pod. And if they've enjoyed this pod, it enjoyed what they've listened to, please give us a rate or review on your favorite streaming choice and have a good one. Bye.